Okay, so the second hour. Now, I mentioned something last time called a functional group. And I said alcohol is a functional group. If you had a benzene, or better yet, just a cyclohexane, and put an OH on it, it's not a hydroxide, it's an alcohol. If you have methane, which we talked about this last time, one hydrogen, please. Natural gas, replace one hydrogen with an OH, that's an alcohol. So, any carbon, we'll call any carbon an R. I did not make that up. Any carbon is an R. Oh, did I lose my little focus here? There we go. Good. Let's make sure it's focused. Yeah, good. So, any carbon is an R. If you have an OH, this is an alcohol group. And it's going to have a name ending that was methan all. All means alcohol. We'll name these again for you. This is cyclohexane with an all, cyclohexane all, if you're curious. We'll start that over again in a minute. But I have to get around all these functional groups to you. So, carb with an OH, alcohol. If you have a carbon with a C double bond O to a hydrogen at the end of a chain. So carbon could be five carbons, carbon, 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 but if there's a carbon to a C double bond O to an H, this is an aldehyde. Language of chemistry. Then if you had a carbon to a C double bond O, but then to another carbon, this would be like, CH3, C to a bond O, CH3. CH3, CH2, C to a bond O, CH3. Benzene ring, whatever. This is a ketone. I need the word keto, keto sugar, uh, aldo sugars will come up later on when we talk about all that stuff. All right, let's see. Now I could have a carbon with a C double bond O. But now it looks like there's an alcohol on here. If you have an alcohol on the same carbon that has a C double bond O, which is actually called a carbonyl, because that's called an alcohol, that's a hydroxy, you would say. But if you have C double bond O, OH, this is a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. Let me smell that. Now, if you had a carbon to an oxygen to a carbon, CH3, CH3, O, CH3, CH3, this is called an ether. If you have a carbon, but yeah, you would do this. Let's put it up here. Let's say you have a carbon to a C double bond O, to an O, but then to another carbon. So instead of the carboxylic acid, which is R C double bond O, O H, you have R C double bond O, O R, and R means any carbon. This is called an ester. And there are the perfumes in this world. There are the smell of apples and bananas. These are the bad smells, carboxylic acids, rancid, uh, I'll talk about those, trust me. All right, we haven't done the nitrogens yet, so let's get some nitrogens in there. If you have an R dash N to anything, this is called an amine. Like you could have an R dash N dash R dash R, this is still an amine. But I'm probably only going to deal with two hydrogens at the end of a chain. And then finally, if you have an R dash C double bond O dash N to anything, so now the N has to be next to a carbon with a C double bond O, this is an amide. 
Many of your glues are acrylamide, things like that. Person needs to be able to spot functional groups. Let me give you some functional groups. If I have a benzene ring minding its own business, and I put a C double bond out here and say spot the functional group, you circle it, carbon, but you're looking for oxygens and you're looking for nitrogens because they're different. Carbon, C double bond out, carbon. Which one was that? Carbon, C double bond, o, carbon. That's carbon, C double bond, o, hydrogen. That's carbon, C double bond, o, OH. This must be a ketone. Now, if I put an OH down here, this is carbon OH, and there's no C double bond o next to it anywhere. That's an alcohol. I wouldn't make you name this molecule. Sometimes I just draw a giant molecule that I make up with a bunch of O's and N's in it, and I want you to circle any functional group you find. So let's try, what's a square? Do you know what a square would be? Well, if it's the world of carbons, four carbons is but, single bonded ane, that's a butane, but it's a cyclobutane. So let's put a O, CH3, C double bond O, OH. All right, O's trigger you to say there's some kind of functional group here. R, just a carbon, C double bond O, OH. R, C double bond O, OH, that's a carboxylic acid. This is R, no C to Obondos here, R, O, R. R, O, R is an ether. These are the ones that put you to sleep. Circle and name all the functional groups you see. If there was an NH2 here, if there's no C to Obondo next to it, that's an amine, that's the amine type. Let's say I had, this will be interesting. That's a good one. Only two functional groups in here. Got them to reading. R, C, O, O, R. Carbon, carbon. R, C, O, 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 but then an O right next to it, then an R. I mean, the yell so much. R, C, O, 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 R. This here is an ester. This is R, O, R. This is just an ether. Well, there's going to be a lot of ex uh, examples of practice after your exams and stuff, so we'll get back to this. But let me leave these functional groups up. Let me start talking about them one by one, and I'll review with the alcohol first. Okay, naming specific alcohols. First, I've already given you a couple. CH3OH was methanol. Wood alcohol. A couple tablespoons will kill you, I said. Then I had CH3. CH2OH. Now this looks like that O is on that H, but H can only be with one bond. So what this is, is CH3. Like if I said draw ethanol, which I've already done last class, F, so here's you doing ethanol from scratch. F, two carbons, all, OH at the end. Put the hydrogens in. You're better off just doing it like this because you won't mess up how many hydrogens you put on it. Here, you might do CH3, CH3, OH, not realizing you put five bonds on a carbon. So, F and single bond, all. This was a rubbing alcohol and drinking. So, this is drinking 
and rubbing alcohol. Didn't get on time. Now, I want you to be able to do the first 10 of these. If I said propanol, you'd say carbon, carbon, carbon. How do you know that? Because you know three carbons is prop. Pan, single bond, all OH. But there was a special propanol. This is normal propanol. The special one I wanted you to know was this. C, OH in the center, down to an H. CH3, CH3. This is isopropyl. Rubbing alcohol. What we clean a wound with and things like that. How we disinfect your skin before we give you a needle. So if I did CH3 here, CH, CH3, OH. You need to be able to see these in all directions. Carbon to a carbon, carbon to two carbons and an O, carbon to a carbon. Carbon to a carbon, carbon to two carbons and an O, carbon to a carbon. They're both isopropyl alcohol. Let's say I said a big one. Octanol. Now, I can put these O's anywhere, but I'm only going to want them at the end. I'm not going to make you learn all of organic chemistry and have to number them. But octanol, where are you at? Oct, eight. Let's draw eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Put an OH at the end. Then put your hydrogens in. You have to show your hydrogens. Now, if you're good enough to condense it, you are. But if you haven't condensed this, you have to show the hydrogens. But there's plenty of time on exams. This way you can feel comfortable. It might take a little bit more time, but you know you've got the right amount of hydrogens and the right amount of carbon bonds. But let me show you a condensation. It's a CH3, and then a CH2 repeats a lot. But the last CH2 has an OH. You can't put him in that bracket. So you have one CH3 here. If you're not good enough, don't do these. Well, if you're not comfortable enough, don't do these. Now, CH2, one, two, three, four, five, six times. He's different. So, CH2 repeated six times. You put a three there, it's wrong because it's only two. Then there's a CH2OH after it. And that would be a short version of octanol. Okay. So, these are the alcohols I talked about rubbing alcohol last time. I'm going to have you be able to write structures for a couple of these guys. Alcohol's done. Let's see. <laughs> Got that done. There's another one I'll show you. I like. I don't like, but. Here's a special molecule. Ethylene glycol. Only because of what it's used for, I want you to know it. It's this strange structure. It's like ethanol, except it has two OHs. This is anti-freeze. So water freezes at zero and boils at 100, but if you had a place that's extremely cold or extremely hot, you want water to freeze at way below zero and boil way above 100 in case you go from the desert to the, to the coldest part in the world, okay? So you add antifreeze, but this particular antifreeze, ethylene glycol, cats eat and die. Nobody knows why cats seem to like the phrase, no one, the flavor of it, but... Uh, that's why they say pet safe ethylene glycol. Like if you do salt for getting rid of um, ice, they'll have pet safe salt that doesn't hurt their paws if you're into protecting your pets. So I think I want ethylene glycol as a special one. Okay, here's another special one. Oh, I lost my mind. 
Well, let me get rid of my mod. Okay. Now, this is a benzene, right? This is methane. If you wanted to bond methane to something more important, take it off, put a benzene. Now CH3 is a methyl group. But if benzene wasn't the most important, let's say it was bonded to like eight carbons here. <laughs> no, I'm going up and down. I told you you can't. But eight carbons here. This becomes a phenyl. So instead of saying a benzyl, it's a phenyl group. A benzene bonded to something else is a phenyl. It is not the most important thing you name. With that in mind, Races ethylene glycol. There's a special case, a special reactivity with the aromatic. If you have this, a benzene, but it has an OH, this is called phenol. And this is an antiseptic. Life expectancy on this planet went down so far when people stopped using soap. Um, they didn't realize it, but you know, you skin. Just imagine if you never took a shower, you'd have all these like skin diseases killing it. But if you think about the Civil War in the 1860s, you would have this big tent, tent of all these people, and these people would have like flesh wounds, and they'd say, That's a flesh wound, let me bandage it up. That's a flesh wound. So they bandage, they bandage them all up. The doctor goes from patient to patient, but the doctor didn't wash their hand. They had a lot of morphine, so people got addicted to opiates to not feel pain, but they didn't think to wash their hands. It was really, really strange. People didn't think about smells, didn't think about those kind of things back then. So to make a long story short, they come back a week later, take open the, the cloth, and they say, it's gangrene. Then they realize we probably should have washed our hand between patients. The first antiseptic was phenol. This thing took off a layer of skin So it hurt really bad, but it would clean the cutout. This would be like a ridiculous one. Now, let me show you today's. I would like you to know that phenols, the class of compounds called phenols, are antiseptics. So I'm just going to draw a generic one. I want, if I say phenol, you draw that structure. If you draw that structure, I say phen. If I give you that structure, you say phenol. If I put it like this, here's a phenol. But let's say I put some carbons on here, CH2, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH3. This kind of makes it less aggressive on your skin. So today's phenols still have the antiseptic property, but they're a little less painful. The first one was really, really bad, okay? So phenol and ethylene glycol would be the two special alcohols. Getting past that, Let's name some fun ones that I like. And let's try to do a, a well, let's see, I won't need esters. First of all, a prefix type of thing. This is four carbons, methane. That with a nitrogens and amine, if you have I didn't say four carbons, I didn't say four hydrogens. If this one is a carbon with three hydrogens, but then an NH2, this is not a special ammonia thing. It's an amine if it's bonded to carbons. This is methyl, because that's a methyl group now, amine. So if I said propyl amine, you draw propane, and you won't get your numbers of hydrogens wrong if you do it this way. You draw a propane, and on either end, but the end is best, draw an NH2. That would be a propylamine, just put in your hydrogens. So now you can name the first 10 amines. Decalamine, hexalamine, just depends how many carbons you put. You can name the first 10 alcohols. You can name heptanol, seven carbons with an OH at the end. You can name a phenol 
and you could uh, know that phenols are antiseptics, and you get the ethylene glycol, which is ethyl, two carbons with two OHs. So that takes care of the amines. Get them out of the way. Maybe I'll just erase them one by one. Now, this is a little different. First of all, alcohols end in all. Meth and all, single bonds. F and all, single bonds. Two carbons. Aldehydes end in al. So let's say I said meth and al. And I said meth and all. Methanol, one carbon with an OH. Methanol, one carbon with a C double bond H. Because aldehydes are at the end of the chain, C double bond H. Ethanol, E-T-H-A-N-A-L, that would be C double bond OH. But since it's F, two carbons, and that is part of the carbon chain, C here. F and Al. Now, for meth and Al, there's only one room for one hydrogen. And this was called formaldehyde. This was in bombing fluid. If you recall, I said if somebody takes methanol instead of ethanol, Two tablespoons will kill them because their body doesn't try to make it into the acetic, uh, uh, the, the hangover drug I talked about, that feeling of hangover you get from ethanol being converted to acetylaldehyde, but you don't need that word. But methanol gets converted to bombing fluid, and that's why you die. If you're wondering, it's going to be why you die class, right? Now, I did a benzene with an OH and made phenol. Let's try this. Let's try a benzene with an aldehyde. This is called benzaldehyde. It's not phenylaldehyde, but I'd be impressed if you wrote that, <laughs> OK? Because it shows you're thinking. Benzaldehyde. It's, a, it's like the smell of, a, of uh, Italian cookies, that anisep thing or something like that. All right, now. I said alcohols end in all, aldehydes end in al, carboxylic acids end in oic acid. Carboxylic acids end in oic acid. So let's say I said hex and all. Hexan all. Hex. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's not a cyclohex. I can't tell you how many times I see an exam where, well, that's mostly the in class exams, but people make everything a ring because it's enjoyable or something. Okay? If I don't say cyclo, it's not a ring. Hexan all. Put an OH on it. Three hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two hydrogens you're done. If I said hexyl, amine, amine was an NH2 at the end of a chain. Erase that, put an NH2. So here's what I'm thinking you're going to do. You're not going to trust yourself. You're going to say, oh my god, the only thing that matters are the points that I get, not that I get this big, long education, etc. I want to make sure I will look up every single thing on Google. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, what am I going to do? I only have some of my minutes. It's, it gets kind of silly after a while because you could do some of these just by knowing some of these rules and be much faster. But, if, but however you handle the class is up to you because it's really not about the points, okay? It's, it's more about you learning some stuff to be able to know what's in your house and what's going to blow up at the end. What kind of paints are dangerous? So hexanol had an OH, hexylamine, hexamine. Now, 
would this be? That would be hexen al, but only if I put the three hydrogens, the two hydrogens, the two hydrogens, the two hydrogens, the two hydrogens. Hexen al. But now let's say hex and oic acid. Don't freak out about it. You just say hex means six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now I'm putting C double bond O O H at the end. Hexan oic acid. Here's my hydrogens going in. If I wanted the full points, I do. They all had old names. That was caprylic acid, the smell of goats. Okay, so that was like a pretty rough thing, but. Uh, People try to eat goat cheese or something. It's like something going on with caprylic acid. You're like, this is, this is sharp. This is a little bit acidic. There's some cheeses out there that are frightening to you. You'll learn about that. A lot of times you can break perfumes down. You could break down um, esters, which are the beautiful smell of fruit. And if you sweat badly, you might break it down to the smell of goats. Everybody's chemistry is different. We'll talk about perfumes. So what can we do so far? Well, let's see. Alcohols are done. Aldehydes are done. Uh, let's see, carboxylic acids are done. I want to do ketones and ethers together. So let us do ketones and ethers together. You just name both sides, I'll say to you. Okay, first of all, C O C. If I said put in the right amount of hydrogens, oxygen takes two. One, two, three. One, two, three. If I said C, O, C, C, first of all, in the world of ethers, R, O, R, there's no C double bond O going on here. Put the aces in here. This is a CH3 bonded to an O bonded to a CH3. Both of these are correct as dimethyl ether. Ethers put you to sleep. It'll make you vomit a whole lot if you're sick, if it's an old style ether, but they were important things. This is not symmetric. This has a methyl and an ethyl. So you'd have to get these right. You'd have to say, if you want to condense it, CH3O, add to CH2. CH2, then that to CH3. Only the end of the chains. This is methyl ethyl ether. What will people do if they want to like shortcut things? Methyl ethyl ether? They'll do CH3, O, CH3, CH2, because they've memorized that an ethyl is CH3, CH2, but that's only if it's bonded here. You got to respect the order of these things. Methyl ethyl ether. Now, I said a benzene would be a phenyl. Here's a benzene. If it was an OH, it would be phenol. Take the H off, put a CH3. This is phenylmethyl ether. Hopefully that makes some sense. So what would this be? Aside from something that looks like a little ship of some sort. Well, hopefully you can spot it as an ether because it's carbon, oxygen, carbon. But if I said just name this, 
three carbons in a ring, that's a cyclopropane, and that's a cyclopropane. If it's not the most important thing, now it's a cyclopropyl group. Cyclopropyl, cyclopropyl, dicyclopropyl ether. Now, I said I wanted to name ethers, but I also want to name ketones. You can name ketones by naming both sides the same way, because they're sandwiched in the middle. So let's just change these into ketones. Phenyl methyl ether, phenyl benzene ring, OCH3. Now, C double bond OCH3. Phenyl methyl ketone, because it's R, C double bond O, R. Phenyl methyl ketone. So what's this? This is methyl ethyl ether. Change the O to a C double bond O. Methyl ethyl ketone. What else we got here? Dicyclopropyl ether. Take the O out, put a C double bond O. Dicyclopropyl ketone. So I hope you're seeing a trend. Alcohols end in all. You say how many carbons, meth and, F and, proban, alcohols end in all, aldehydes end in al, carboxylic acids end in oic acid, amines end in the word amine. Uh, let's see. So now, if you're naming either ketones or ethers, there's many other ways to name these. I just name both sides. If I see it's a ketone, if I can recognize a functional group, R, acetobono, R, no other oxygens here, or nitrogens. Cut them like that, a phenyl, a methyl, and a ketone. A methyl, a methyl, and ether, so it's dimethyl ether. A methyl, an ethyl, an ether, so it's methyl ethyl ether. A methyl, an ethyl, a ketone, it's methyl ethyl ketone. Now, of course, it's easy for me, I've done it forever, but I mean, it's just a language, you have to accept it, but it's pretty really well-defined language here. Once you got these 10 hydrocarbons and you know your functional groups, you're good to go. We need these things. Let me erase these and talk about stuff, because I want to make sure I give you a good lecture. You're probably saying, I just want the points up, Sinsky. Oh, maybe you also want to learn some deep conceptual stuff and look brilliant for your kids someday. Not look brilliant, be brilliant for your kids someday. How about that? For someone else's family member, or anyone really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now I want to explain something special. This. I said if you have like CH3. CH2, six times CH3. What's that? Octane. This is nonpolar. So if you mixed it with water, H2O is on the bottom, octane is on top. Water is the aqueous phase. Add some salt, it's going to go to that level. Add some sugar, it's going to go to that level. Add some wax, it's going to stay in this level because they don't like each other. This is a light, not aqueous phase liquid. So I've been explaining light, non aqueous, like right, phase liquids. L, N, A, P, L. If you're an environmental chemist that's called an LNAP or a pollutant, you find it on top of the water when there's an oil spill. Add a few chlorines and it sits below water. So if I had, let's see, this, H, here you go, the horrible chemical, H, 
CL, CL, CL. That still is nonpolar, but this species called chloroform, chloroform sits on the bottom. So this is H2O, and this would be the CHCl3. This would be the dense non aqueous phase liquid. So this would be a DNAP. The dense non aqueous phase liquids are actually quite frightening things because they sit on the bottom of a lake. Chloroform is another story. Chloroform is something that, like, if you um, watch old movies, like, if, okay, I got a bottle of water here. Here's a bottle of water. If you look at it, it's got all kinds of words on it. Nothing in this world in chemistry is going to be a bottle that says acid. Like if someone is watching a movie and the movie seems very serious and they hold a bottle, they say acid. There's, there's no thing labeled that way usually, okay? It's because they know the public knows that much. Well, sadly, this is a trick that you in movies a lot. This was big in the 1960s. You would take rag in the movies and they put some chloroform and put it over a woman's face and then she would go to sleep because it's actually an anesthetic and then she'd wake up and be able to run with James Bond. If she woke up, she'd throw up a whole lot, okay? This is a horrible thing to put people to sleep with, right? But um, anyway, chloroform, if you mixed it with water, it would sit underwater. If it was that good of an anesthetic, we'd be using it for surgeries, but not using chloroform for surgeries. So, I mean, where do you see these kind of things? If you've ever seen uh, a glass thing with different colored liquids and you turn it over and they all drip with each other, you look at it and say, oh my God, it's beautiful. It makes a water wheel go inside of there. To me, I look at it and I say, boy, this would be some pretty bad chemicals to have three different phase liquids jumping over each other and then, and then some sand and stuff in there. Anyway, continue on. We're doing it on time. Don't stress. You're like, well, I can just turn it off, but I know. Why do you want to go so fast in life? You've got so many more minutes left in your life, right? I want to mention something about anesthetics again. First of all, I wanted you to know that phenols were antiseptics. I want you to know ethers are anesthetics. So they put you to sleep. want to be put to sleep? Well, let's say everyone's different. They are. This is awake. And this is death. That means you'd be asleep, okay? This here is like coma. We do not understand coma, okay? What does the anesthesiologists get paid so much money for. Well, if I had uh, something that needed to be operated near my heart, I need to fix a valve. You have to cut me open here, rip open my ribs, and then do something. If a Roman soldier came up to you and used a sword and cut you open, you'd be in a lot of pain. You'd scream, you'd say, please stop cutting my chest open, all that kind of stuff. We need to cut you open. Now, a beautiful thing about sleep is, there's no pain, okay? You don't feel pain during sleep. But if your body was being pinched while you were sleeping, it would say, wake the heck up, this person is pinching you. But if we gave you an anesthetic and took you low enough down, you wouldn't feel it. So what they wanna do is the anesthesiologist has to play around with this game by watching your oxygen levels and you sign away all your notes to the doctor saying pretty much, you know, uh, you could mess up really badly and I could never sue you and I'll be in a coma the rest of my life and I'm sorry about that, but you did your best. So. To make a long story short, the anesthesiologist has paid a lot of money to try to take you as close to this as possible so you don't feel any pain when we're opening it up and doing a back surgery on you or something. But sometimes they take you too far and yeah, there's complications and you are in a coma. It's a horrible thing. So to make a long story short, why are anesthetics so important? Well, they want to take people down so we can do surgery on them. But we're too afraid of taking people to coma, so more and more we just like 
do the surgery while you are awake. And we say, look in that direction. And they, I don't, I say we as if I've done this, but I haven't, of course. But um, they want to keep you awake because they're trying to not have to do that kind of anesthesia. And they just give you a block and they can numb your entire arm. And I mean, that's a better thing. Although a lot of people don't want to be awake for anything. Do you really trust them to bring you back? Like dentistry. People hate dentistry, but there's very few dentists in this town. Uh, Dr. Hammond and Ben Rowan does it. My wife loves that stuff, but um, I don't do that. But uh, they'll put you to sleep for a cleaning if you want, but you pay like $200, $300 extra for the anesthesia. It's a lot of work. So anyway, that takes care of me discussing uh, the concept of being awake and why you would need to be put to sleep for anything. And I will give you this hint too. Let's say you have cataracts. Cataracts are a um, something that they don't want to put you to sleep for everything. They want to keep you awake because they don't want to have to risk taking them, all these people into coma. But they could put you to sleep for a cataract if they wanted to. So a cataract is this haze that forms over your eye and you have to get it removed or someone used to do a lens or something. So what happens is your eye doesn't really have any nerves, but they have to do some kind of thing. They have to do what they have to do. So they say to you, and you should remember this in case you ever get cataracts, Look at the bright light and stare at the bright light. Whatever you do, stare at the bright light. Listen to what the doctor says, stare at the bright light. Because if you look in the other direction, there's a big needle coming at your eyeball and then you, you would freak you out and you, they've held you down and it's kind of a sad thing. So let's see where we're at on time. What have we done? Well, we've named a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to do is mention something about chlorofluorocarbons. Chloro fluorocarbons, CFCs. These are very stable. Now, to be honest, they're very safe, too. You could have a gas like this, FCL, CL, F. Completely non-reactive thing, floats around as a gas. These are like our freons for refrigeration or for air conditioning for AC but the problem is they react with the ozone layer I mentioned that to you we need the ozone layer to protect us so if the chlorofluorocarbon, we used to use it for propellants for the longest time before everything was in pump, everything was propellant, aerosol cans. We thought it was so cool. We would spray in the 1960s uh, probably antiperspirant, a big cloud of this stuff that seals your skin was all around us and people thought it was great. But now we've gone to pumps because the aerosol would be so stable we had spray butter, okay? We just sprayed butter on things. But the aerosol would be so stable that it would go all the way up to the upper atmosphere and cause troubles and destroy the ozone layer. So they say no CFCs. If something says no CFCs, what they might have done is they might have taken like one of these off and put a hydrogen, which makes it reactive enough you can get rid of it in the environment or something like that. So, Chlorinated hydrocarbons are used for insecticides. I'll show you one of these things. And don't worry, I'll just use this last sheet of paper for that. I'm looking at a clock. You probably don't believe me. Chlorinated hydrocarbons, you're not made of the same stuff that a bee is made of. Like if I were to die in the woods, my skin would just like dissolve and look really horrible on time. If a beetle dies in the woods, it looks beautiful after a couple of weeks, but you're picking up it's extremely light because the outside of its skin is all sugar. The outside of its skin is like wood. The outside of its skin is like something called a kite. So if you take gasoline and throw it on bees, kills them instantly. Throw gasoline on me, I might get like long-term nerve damage or some kind of cancer, but I don't really mind it as much, okay? Hopefully. So getting past that chlorinated hydrocarbons, this one here, here's a benzene, but you put a CL, 
Here's a C. There's another benzene on it. Let's put a CL. Let's put an H. Now we'll do C, CL, CL, CL. Something like this, wherever there's a chlorine to carbon bond, the insect can't do nothing about it. This was called DDT in the old days. And insecticide that we stopped using in America, but the rest of the world still wants to use DDT. It did something very strange. It bioaccumulated because it would sit in fat cells. Okay, so DDT was an insecticide. Like when I was a child, uh, there would be a spray for mosquitoes and the thing that looked like a tank would come around and spray a fog and you'd all dance in the fog of this insecticide because we were really very strange in the early 1970s. But this is probably what happened to me, right? This DDT right here would bioaccumulate a food chain. So it would be in a certain parts per million in the water, then a certain parts per million in the fish, and a certain parts per million in the larger fish, and then a certain parts per million in the American bald eagle. And the American bald eagle's shell, here's his egg, or her egg, I guess, the shell would become brittle to the point where if she sat on it, it broke, and the bald eagle population was going down. And because they're the American bird, the symbol of America, we never used a turkey. People thought about using a turkey. They decided, don't sell DDT in America anymore. We'd like to keep bald eagles. So things do go up the food chain about accumulate. That's enough for this week. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'll be turning it off now, and I'll be posting it in time. <sighs> Have a good day. All right. Stop recording.